Welcome in to Locked On Knicks, and the Knicks are getting ready for the playoffs. Other teams are playing in the play-in, but we don't have that problem. So we're going to take some time and pick the end-of-year awards, Knicks-specific edition. We're going to pick the MVP. You might be able to guess who that is. The Game of the Year candidate, the most valuable non-star on the team, the Play of the Year, and much more next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks. Your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that notification bell or the auto download function on your favorite podcast app or YouTube so you can make sure that you never miss an episode. Of course, big things going on right now. A little bit of an off week right now, a little chill time, but then we're right in the thick of the playoffs and we're going to be putting episodes out fast and furious and you want to make sure you never miss one. So get that, uh, get those auto download and notification settings all lined up so you don't miss any. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor-in-chief of Nick's site, The Strickland, which you can find at thestrick.land. And he's Gavin Shaw, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster. Favorite play-by-play broadcaster. Looking spiffy today in a nice collared checkered shirt. You, and, you, know, you know why, Alex? I was at uh, the Jets practice facility doing a flag football uh, game, supporting supporting your boys. Well, there you go. Look at that. I'm supporting the Jets uh, in their stupid new uniforms that I'm like the yeah, only person that doesn't like. I, I did uh, throw up when I got home, so but it was, it was good, <laughs> good while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate we're picking new york knicks awards for this season um gavin i think we could lead with probably the most slam dunk one of them all uh a unanimous vote in knicks mvp voting jalen brunson uh do you want to give the the first bit of the uh the speech for him i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I had I had Ryan Archdiacono, but eventually the the public pressure wore out, and I went I went with our guy Jalen Brunson. The, the the more interesting part of this conversation, maybe that I, I was just thinking of while you were you were teeing us up, is if Julius Randle had stayed healthy, would he have made a run at this? Which uh, I'll let you give your take on. But um, yeah, he's he's the he's the undisputed winner, uh, third highest scoring season in team history at twenty eight point seven points per game that incredible 61 point night against the Spurs that will come up again later um, one away from Carmelo Anthony's record two different 50 point games that puts him uh, with Bernard King Allen Houston and uh, Richie Guerin was it Richie Guerin as the only Richie player to do so Richie Guerin mm-hmm. um, 31 and a half points seven assists uh, 48 37 86 slash post Randall history post Randall injury fifth most threes in a season in Knicks history um, second in the NBA with 35 charges drawn. And in that uh, Suns game, um, I think the the most threes in NBA history without a miss ever uh, with nine, which was uh, absurd. So an all-time season for Jalen Brunson, one that warrants league MVP consideration. How could he not be our next MVP? Yeah, and I think if we were going to, you know, lay out the just why it's so unanimous and whatever, it's just – the way that he picked this team up after Julius Randle went down and when you could have reasonably made a case that, yeah, or while well, we were making the case of like, well, this, this stinks. Like uh, <laughs> season's probably more or less over at this point. You know what I mean? Like, especially, well, okay. The Julius Randle injury, we didn't know for sure at that time was going to be season ending. We, so we I guess thought like, it was over if he didn't come back. I, I think yeah. I yeah. Like there was it, like, we were kind of like, if this doesn't work out and he doesn't come back, like things are not looking good. And it's going to be a real, real struggle uh, from the time that he's, you know, the time that he went down until whenever he comes back. And yet the Knicks end up winning 50 games, take the two seed against all odds. And uh, I, you know, you can give credit to a million different people. Uh, well, not a million, but specifically like five or six um on the team you know that that made that possible OG Ananobi whenever he was available obviously was fantastic as a Hartenstein Josh Hart Dante DiVincenzo um you know everybody on the team at Precious Achua had you know a part to play in it at times like the Deuce McBride you know everybody had their moment Alex in the sun, Burks. but yeah but the the constant was Jalen Brunson 
Um, I, I was joking. That's, I was joking. I didn't, I didn't actually. <laughs> <do that. laughs> but, you know, yeah. Uh, Tom Thibodeau as well also deserves tons of credit. But Jalen Brunson, I mean, his his singular performances just, you know, made it uh, made it a season to remember for the Knicks and, and certainly a season to remember for him. But in a season to remember, there are going to be lots of memorable games, Gavin. So we have a number of uh, of big games here that we have for potential game of the year candidates. So uh, I figure I'll throw it to you first if you want to introduce uh, the first game here on the list. Yeah, sure. So our our first one, this, I, I don't think it's ultimately my pick, but I mean, maybe it will be. I don't know. I, I, this is this was the only one for some reason I didn't pick before we, we started the show. Uh, but this might be my favorite game of the year. OG's debut. Um, like it's easy to forget now because you you and I were just sort of reminiscing. Like it feels like a different like century before the OG and an OB trade, and yet it was it was only a few short months ago. Um, but Minnesota coming in number one team in the West. I don't know about you. I think coming into that game, all I was hoping for was like, all right, he he fits in pretty well it looks pretty clean and the Knicks put up a decent fight and, and don't get blown out and, and they just have a little bit of momentum going into what was eventually going to be an easier stretch there and instead the Knicks like basically controlled that game through three quarters and Anobi is extraordinary guarding Anthony Edwards Carl Anthony Towns everyone in between the Wolves make a late punch on the Knicks and the Knicks are able to survive because Julius Randle just made crazy shot after crazy shot down the stretch of that game. And I think why it was so important is you go back to, I can remember if the Knicks had played the Wolves in the regular season. Didn't, didn't the Wolves blow out the Knicks in the regular season before that game? But they also said that that preseason game, I think is what might be going on in my mind where they were close for a half. And then the Wolves were just too big and too physical. I know people who listen to every episode are probably tired of hearing me say this, but my feeling the whole first part of the year was just that the Knicks were ridiculously small. I just looked, they did lose by 17 at Minnesota back on November 20th. And Minnesota was one of those teams that exposed it in a way almost no one else did. And then they, they make this one move and all of a sudden that wasn't an issue. And if anything, they were the team like putting down the punishment all of a sudden. And, and to me, that set the tone for the rest of the year. Yeah, and then how about uh, the Knicks 100 Heat 98? And that game was on uh, November 24th. And, of course, a huge comeback uh, in the in-season tournament. Remember that little thing early in the season where it was encouraged for teams to run up scores and stuff? That sure was fun. Um, but this was you know, one that kept the Knicks alive for the in-season tournament, which they did eventually uh, qualify for. Thanks to this win and then a big win against Charlotte later on. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a big one. Uh, R.J. Barrett, 18 points, a plus nine. But Emmanuel quickly, probably his piece de, res, de la resistance. Piece de resistance? I think it's just, it just piece de resistance. Maybe. Piece de resistance uh, for this season, uh, which, you know, he had plenty. And, you know, that's a guy that as much as it feels like eons ago, I, I don't want to fade from my memory too soon uh but 20 points in this one a plus 22 in 26 minutes huge comeback uh to to you know beat the heat which is great uh maybe something that the knicks with the new cast of characters can channel if the heat end up winning the play-in game and becoming their uh first opponent in the playoffs this year but uh either way i think this was a, a very memorable game and uh and you know one of the better comebacks of the year and one of the better like vibes games of the year, um, even if it came in the in in like era one of this season rather than the modern uh, current era. Yeah, uh, ne next one is is maybe my my second favorite one. Uh, Knicks Sixers Knicks one twenty eight Sixers ninety two. That game just stands out to me in the sense of like you kept waiting for Philly to make a run, and and I referenced this the other day, but it's it's easy to forget. Now that Philly's falling down the standings and Embiid was out for such a huge chunk of the year, but they were neck and neck with Boston for the one seed. They were like statistically the second best team in basketball. And it, it just sort of felt like similar to that Wolves game. Like, all right, at some point, the Knicks are going to get overwhelmed here. And instead of that happening, the opposite happened where the Knicks just just wrecked them and ran away with that game. 
And Embiid, I know he got hurt early. I know it wasn't his best outing, but like still put up big numbers. And, and yet the numbers from that game are staggering. Jonathan Macri wrote an article on this today. And I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to quote uh, the Knicks film school newsletter here. It was the third lowest plus minus of Embiid's career, minus 29. Josh Hart put up the highest plus minus of any player this season at plus 46. Deuce went four for four from deep in the first quarter. That was the part that I forgot where like that just blew your mind because he hadn't done that yet. And you're like, all right, maybe, maybe we are going to win this game. Um, and the Knicks ultimately won by 36, despite Julius and OG shooting four for 22. And I think that last part is, and like, this is painful to say, because obviously we don't have Julius Randall, but like if the Timberwolves game was an inkling, like, Oh, this team could be really good. That Sixers game was a confirmation of like, all right, they're maybe a top five team in basketball. Now with all these guys on the floor, like to go against the Sixers in their building and beat them by 36 when two of your three best players shoot four for 22, like that, that, that just, that just screams even in a one-off regular season game of a championship type of team. Yeah, I'm with you. And, and what else uh, screamed championship type of team games five and six of the Knicks uh, season long nine game win streak. You smartly put these, these right next to each other because I think that they belong right next to each other and to be talked about in tandem. Uh, 122 to 84 over the Nuggets and 125 to 109 over the Heat. And, I mean, just crazy outcomes for the Knicks. You know, during the Ananobi era, this was as high as this team rode the whole season, uh, in my opinion. Like, during that win streak, you know, they looked like, and, I mean, obviously you're, you're dealing with the second game of that was unfortunately the the game that saw Julius Randle leave for the season. Uh, also saw you lose Ananobi for you know a decent amount of time. But those two games, I mean, that was when we really dared to dream. That was right at the end of January. Uh, the Knicks, of course, then still won three more games in a row after this. But those next three games felt very much uh, beating the odds, <laughs> you know, uh, even if it was against bad teams. But like beating up on the Hornets, beating the Jazz, and then a narrow victory over the Pacers, which we'll talk about uh, in just a second. But, like, yeah, they were they were pretty great games uh, and, and really just kind of reinforced, like, this team looks really awesome and potentially could be a, a dark horse title contender this year. But this is a loaded category. There's still a decent amount of games to get into, including the one that I think we're both going to end up picking – as the game of the year uh, in just a sec, we get to our next segment. We wanted to remind you that this next segment is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week. And it is it is the Knicks getting the two seed. The phrase that's kept coming back in my head is no good deed goes unpunished. It's a dark way to look at the world. Maybe reflect some pessimism that I need to deal with in real life therapy, but I am just worried that the Knicks did the noble thing in in winning that Bulls game, playing it out, showing that they're never say die attitude. They're they're only knowing how to play one way mentality is is limitless and and doesn't have restrictions. And everyone around the world, the NBA world, that is is complimenting them is saying how great it was. And I, I wonder, like, if the season just ends with them losing to one of these two teams, like, do you, do you still? Do you want that pat on the back or would you rather have done like the somewhat like darker path of sitting guys and maybe definitely getting out of the first round and maybe even getting out of the second round? I don't know. Anyways, therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team. It's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash LockedOnNBA. All righty, we are back on Locked On Knicks, wrapping up our game of the year conversation. Um, final three here, Alex. Uh, Knicks Pacers, 109-105. You did the pot on that one. I was heading to a bachelor party. What, what, what are your memories of that win? Yeah, I actually went back, so I don't want to spoil it, but my uh, play of the year 
uh, came out of this game just for how memorable it was. And I was going back. I couldn't remember when exactly happened. I had to do a lot of forensic analysis <laughs> to find. I had to go back in the Strickland Discord and go look for when we made the emoji of that moment. Um, that has been a staple in the Discord ever since then. And like go through all that and and then figure out which game it was and then find that moment and whatever. But this game just was a, a knockdown drag out game. One of the worst ref games of the year for the Knicks. And yet they still overcame it, won their ninth straight. This is when you kind of just felt like this team might be invincible. Um, it, like, how did they just do this? You know, they they beat the Pacers uh, without Ananobi, without Randall with Jalen Brunson getting quite literally punched in the face down the stretch of the game um, on an inbound, having the ball taken out of his hands and thrown up for a layup for the Pacers. That was an uncalled foul where he literally got, I'm, I'm not kidding you go back and watch it clubbed in the face. Uh, it went to the ground in a heap. Like he had just, you know, gotten punched in the face. Um, and yet the Knicks still managed to pull this game out uh, just with crazy amounts of intestinal fortitude. This was just, I don't know. It was a special game. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was also the game where Brunson kind of like broke down a little bit in the post game. Yeah. It and was. yeah. And, you know, like it, it was clearly getting emotional talking about how, you know, MSG is like the best fans in the world and all that. It was that, just kind of that that, like, Alex, am I wrong? Was that the night he found out he made all star too? Oh, that might have been it. Yeah. That might have been part of it too, which was why he was more emotional. Um, either way. Huge game. Awesome game. Uh, I wanted to highlight this one. I've brought this one up a couple times. I think we differ in opinion a little bit on this one just because yeah. of the result. But uh, the only one of these that was not a Knicks win, but Spurs won 30, Knicks won 26. Brunson gets 61 points. Wemby gets 40 and 20 uh, in this game. And I know it's a loss, which ultimately sucks. But I feel like this one is going to be one of those that sticks in everybody's brain for a long time not just for the Brunson 61, which was so magical to watch happen, but also for the fact that like if Wemon Yama cashes in on the potential that he has and actually becomes like one of the greatest of all time, um, I think that we're going to end up looking back at that game and being like, wow, like that was fun watching him duel with Brunson, like in his rookie season on the way to greatness. Um, so I don't know, just in terms of like, all, all time stuff, especially if Wemmy does become that and he spends his whole career with the Spurs, he'll have very little interactions with making the Knicks miserable. It won't be like a Michael Jordan situation or a LeBron James situation where he you know, just at least actively make be in the finals. Yeah, it'll just be in the finals. He'll just <laughs> just beat up on the Knicks in the finals um, <laughs> for years to come or something. But yeah, either way, I, I thought it was a pretty special game. Um, and then the last one, I'll just present it quickly because I feel like we don't have to. We don't have to relive it. It just happened days ago. But the the season finale to get to 50 wins, going to overtime against the Bulls, that was pretty sweet too. You know, regardless of if, you know, how you feel about the the 50th win and the second seed and, you know, whether they should have gotten it or not, like it was in the moment just cool. You could see it meant a lot to the players. And it was just sort of like, I don't know, a perfect dramatic cherry on top to end this season and, you know, give the Knicks one last like, on call unlikely victory, but like gutsy victory, um, you know, still without Julius Randle, you know, but still plugging along and and making things work. So, yeah. But Gavin, which one is your game of the year? I, I just wanted to say quickly on that Bulls game because we didn't talk about it. if that Brunson shot had gone in, I think that might have single handedly made it our game of the yeah, year. That's true, and and that would have been the shot of the year, uh, not yep. just for the Knicks, but for for the NBA or or maybe Max Drews hit the seventy footer. Um, I'm with you on that Spurs game. I, I actually, I, I, I love going back in history and saying, oh wait, those two guys played against each other. And it's not that Brunson and Wemby are so separated in age, but, but to your point, just, just the, the point in their career and that kind of being Wemby, like who's been on this incredible streak, like his announcement that like, no, I'm not, I'm not coming next year. I'm, I'm here right now. And, and, and Brunson to score 60 in that game. Um, and, that, and that's maybe the footnote in, in in the broader NBA world. That's that's a cool one. Um, I am. I think I'm not going with the one you you're going with. I'm going with the first one I mentioned, Knicks Wolves, 
And it was because it just it just sort of felt like earlier this year, the Knicks were diagnosed with a fatal basketball disease. And it was like, hey, you're just too small. If you, if you play a team of size, whether it's the Celtics, whether it's the Pelicans, whether it's the Wolves, like you are just going to get your butt kicked. And, and you could have as many amazing Emmanuel quickly plays as you want. You could have R.J. Barrett having a really hot night. Julius Randle bullying his way inside. Jalen Brunson playing awesome. But guess what? You're just too small when it comes – to uh, nut crunching time, you're going to get physically overwhelmed. You're going to get bullied. You're going to lose basketball games, and that was just it was that was tough to stomach after last year. The Knicks were the bully at times, but it, you just kind of realized they had this fatal flaw on the perimeter. And and one trade, one move, like two days later, like against the biggest, baddest bullies in the NBA this year, and at least on the defensive, and that that's what the Minnesota Timberwolves were. Um, the Knicks came out and beat them, and it, it just started that whole. Magical stretch. That's one of my favorite um, favorite runs of basketball I've ever seen for my favorite team. So I, I I like I like the beginnings of stories. That was a great one. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that Knicks Pacers game. No big surprise. I think I sold it. I think I probably telegraphed that a little bit. But yeah, for all the reasons I just mentioned, all the emotions running high, the Knicks overcoming a you know an ultimately poorly ref game. Um, just during the All Star discourse with you know it. Halliburton versus Brunson and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, for Brunson to step up big and, um, you know, a number of role players coming through, I think that was, that's, that's my game of the year. I don't know. That one it just felt real good when that happened in the moment. So I think that one's mine. All right, cool. Let's, let, let, let's hit the rest of these, uh, a little bit rapid fire. Um, here, here's the fun one. Most valuable non-star. So obviously this eliminates Jalen Brunson, Julius Randall, we both decided, or at least I, I decided, Alex, unless you want to push back on this last second, um, that OG Ananobi counts as a star. And I think I'm, I'm basing that off him having just like the single greatest plus minus front of any trade acquisition in NBA history. Like he, like he, I, I think how I would define a star, maybe not a superstar, but like, do you have a special quality that makes you one of the best in the world? at what you do and and maybe that like maybe there's a world where you could argue something like Duncan Robinson is a star in the in the right year because of that but I, I think Ananobi's defense is such a game changer he's in a different category so with that a long-winded caveat uh, my four nominees were Isaiah Hardenstein Josh Hart Dante DiVincenzo and just because they were so amazing and I think would have ultimately won him this award Mitchell Robinson's first 20 games or so of the year but Alex uh, with, with with that with that big old caveat in the way at least on my end that, who was who your pick for this award well uh I would love to say so but uh I think we're gonna get into that in the next segment and I'll leave everybody in suspense for just a moment longer um but yeah we'll discuss that in the next segment we each pick our winners out of those four candidates as well as the play of the year the most surprising development of this year. And uh, the best Josh Hart quote, because there were certainly plenty of them. Uh, so we'll get into that next on Locked on Knicks. But first, guys, I need you all to listen up for this huge announcement. I've been tracking the leaderboards every day, keeping my eye on the scores, putting all my heart into it. And I'm super pumped to announce I am finally on top. That's right. Obviously, I'm talking about the hit mobile game Monopoly Go. I, I couldn't possibly be at the top of the NBA standings or something like that, although I did win my fantasy basketball league. Anyway, you've probably heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great mobile twist on classic Monopoly. You can play anywhere, anytime. You explore hundreds of Monopoly boards from Las Vegas to Camelot to the moon, all while raking in a huge fortune. So charge rent on iconic properties just like classic Monopoly. You could charge your friends rent on your iconic properties or go after the Monopoly money by pulling bank heists and taking wrecking balls to the landmarks. That's crazy. Uh, but my favorite part is the leaderboards where you can see who's a Monopoly tycoon and who's gone bankrupt. So go get yourself on the charts. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store and Google Play. All right, Gavin, I will, I will remove everybody's suspense here and uh, start giving my case for most valuable non-star. I guess I'll first say, as far as OG, I was with you. Like, I do think there's something about him. I think in the same terms of, like, how we talk about Draymond Green being a star uh, on his team, on the Warriors, despite, you know, usually being, like, a 10.8 rebound kind of guy, like, not a huge, like, larger-than-life presence statistically, um, as far as impact, he's obviously a star, uh, you know, a multi-time defensive 
you know, all defensive team, you know, member and a defensive player of the year winner and all that good stuff. I think OG Ananobi, you know, he has made an all defensive team or perhaps two as he only made one or, or did he make a second one in Toronto? But either way, he's got at least one on the resume. I think if you make an all NBA anything team, you can make a reasonable claim at being a star of some sort, uh, even if it's a more defensive minded star. So I'm totally with you there. Um, I guess I'm going to kind of spoil your uh, your one here. I'm not going to say who it is, but I'm, I'm going to take first crack and say that if I was just making this and I didn't want to do it for the sake of argument, I would probably pick your player. Um, but, you know, just for the sake of being different, I picked a different player. So I went with Dante DiVincenzo. Um, I think the case is pretty succinct, like sets the Knicks three point record with 283 made this year, sets the Knicks single game three point record with 11 made in a single game um, from the time he entered the starting lineup. Here were his stats, uh, or at least when he entered the starting lineup and stayed there, he started like two games, I think, when Grimes was hurt earlier in the season. But um, I'm talking about when he entered the starting lineup and never relinquished it. 17.7 points, four rebounds, three assists. 1.5 steals, 0.5 blocks per game, shot 44.6% from the field, 39.7% from three on extremely high volume, and 76.8% from the free throw line. Gave the Knicks all the scoring that they needed, especially through all the injuries and everything. Was sixth in deflections per game in the NBA. And like my overarching point with him was like for as much as we loved Grimes's potential on the offensive end and even on the defensive end to some degree, Dante just stepped in and did everything I think that we reasonably wanted out of Clinton Grimes and better and just did it at a super elite level. Um, was one of the best three-point shooters, not just on the Knicks, but in the entire NBA and such a consistent presence for them. Um, I also will shout out, I had to give him some award because he's apparently not eligible for most improved player this year, which we were making a case for him the other day. Uh, apparently, despite playing in 81 games because he didn't play over 20 minutes uh, in a number of games for the first part of the season, as he was kind of breaking his way into the Knicks rotation and everything, uh, he was disqualified thanks to the new uh, standard set by the NBA this year, where I guess if you play in less than 20 minutes, it doesn't count as playing in a game anymore. Yeah, only, um, only, two, only two of those games count towards your total. Two of them, yeah, and they have to be between 15 and 20 minutes for yeah, those yeah. ones. You can have two of those. So he came up literally one game shy from being able to draw votes for most improved player, which seems like highway robbery. So I had to give him something here. So he gets yeah. he gets my most valuable non star on the Knicks. It's pretty crazy that the the 50 plus minutes in his last game doesn't count as two games towards that. Like the NBA's. If we're, if we're gonna get ridiculous, let's let's get ridiculous all the way. I'm I'm with you. That's absurd. Um, I I, I don't I don't think it's. I, I know you were gonna pick my guy. I I don't think it's a bad pick. I I think there's a great case for it. I mean, I go back to that 27 point per game stretch over six games where, where Brunson was hurt for a good chunk of that. Um, like like he he just hit levels this year. Um, that I I don't think anyone thought was possible. And and to me, the ultimate case for this. And and as we we find out who the Knicks are playing, get into our playoff preview, like I kind of think he is the ultimate X factor in this Knicks playoff run. Like, like if he plays like he did in the regular season, I, I think the Knicks have a great shot at making the conference finals. If he falls off in a significant way, I, I think that might be the single most damaging thing to the Knicks. And it might be the thing I'm most worried about, but my winner for this award um, was Isaiah Hardenstein. He was second in the entire NBA in, in defensive uh, estimated plus minus, which is an all inclusive Defensive stat that is is not um, super dependent on total minutes. Like uh, Marcus Smart is is third in the entire league. Jonathan Isaac just barely edged out Hartenstein. Both those guys played way, 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 way less minutes than Hartenstein did on the year. So there, there's a case, at least by one metric, that he is is the best defender um, in the NBA this season, or at least the most valuable. Um, he was he was essential. Mitch set such an insanely high standard as arguably the Knicks' most important player. The first. 10 games of the season and Isaiah after an acclimation period, like didn't just match Mitch's production. He eclipsed it. Like the Knicks found a way to fully maximize him as a passer this year. And, and to me, his presence on offense unlocked Jalen Brunson in a way we wouldn't have seen if Mitch had never gotten down, just providing that 10%, 20% extra spacing versus Mitch doesn't seem valuable, but I, I think it, it took Brunson 
to another level around the rim and changed how defenses were able to guard him. He was also unlocked as an off ball cutter, which was just like when Mitchell Robinson, Julius Randle, and RJ Barrow were on the floor, there was no one to pass it to him and there was also no room to cut into. And that's an element of Brunson's game that has really shined since the all-star break. And then just offensive rebounds. Like he, he's been nearly as good of an offensive rebounder as Mitch was. Obviously, that's just huge for the Knicks offense in general, but it gets Brunson, DiVincenzo, those wide open, clean look threes that have fueled their offense all season long. Defensively protects the glass, um, cleans the glass as a rebounder, ridiculous steal rate for a center, uh, makes some insane hustle plays, one of which we're going to reference later on. Uh, you know, I'll just say that play against the Bucks is one of my favorites of the year where he dove and then he dove again to punch it out. Uh, without him, I, I just don't see a world where they're close to the two seed. And he is he's ultimately my most valuable non-star because he was the biggest key to the Knicks MVP, Jalen Brunson being their MVP. All right. Well, let's start getting into our plays of the year. Um, I'm going to I'll I'll highlight first Jalen Brunson dropping Alex Caruso, uh, which was a fun one. Uh, Brunson, I mean, I was, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't need too much context. I mean, he just crossed him out of his shoes and dropped into the floor and hit a jumper over him. It was awesome. Um, you always love to see it. You love to see some ankles get broken on a basketball court, especially satisfying against Alex Caruso, considering he's just such a nasty defender and, I mean, we saw it just this past week, loves to try to make Jalen Brunson's life hell as much as humanly possible, although I think Brunson came out on top in that arrangement uh, over the course of the last week. So, but yeah, just a, a fantastic play there. Yeah, that was great. Um, I already referenced uh, Hartenstein's, the the double dive. Like, it, like if that doesn't epitomize this team in, in, in one sequence, um I don't know what does. And, and and Tom Thibodeau w was drooling. Like he, he borderline asked the reporters to, to leave the room um, and lock the door after describing that play. Um, I'm, I'm going to save, I think Alex, we should both save our, our top two. So I'll, I'll just throw the one, one more runner up for both of us. And that was uh Bogdanovich is up and under on Giannis. And, and this is, I will clarify, this is undoubtedly some recency bias. I did not put an immense amount of time into these. So in, in the comments, drop your favorites. I'm sure I forgot some great ones. Maybe I even forgot the best one, but this was recent. This was epic. The bogey up and under on Giannis, like someone who just looks like pretty close to the least athletic player in the NBA going up against like the, the biggest freak in the league. The guy is nicknamed the Greek freak. Um, and, and he just somehow snuck it under his right arm to finish that up and under. That was, that was insane. I, I could not believe my eyes. I, I watched that maybe 10 times over before continuing with the game. But Alex, what was ultimately your pick for, uh, for play of the year? My pick for play of the year. And I don't know, maybe this isn't like of all the plays that could possibly be this play. This one just, it's the play that stuck with me the most this year. So you know, we don't choose what what ends up being the uh, the thing that sticks in our brain, but uh, Precious's big putback against the Pacers to put the Knicks up 105 to 100. No big surprise, a play out of what I think was the game of the year. Um, things were shaky at best at that moment. Uh, Knicks only up three, and you know, it just seemed like things were not going their way as far as like the refing and stuff like that. Like you could feel like, Oh, there's going to be like one bad call. Something's going to screw this up. Like they really need to create this distance and precious crashes in on, I think it was a Brunson miss uh, on like a floater. He just comes in out of nowhere, boxes out. I think he had 12 points and 16 rebounds in that game. Cause I had to like really look to find when exactly this happened. I thought I'd like, I, I almost thought I'd like hallucinated this play at one point because <laughs> I was looking for the celebration, which I thought was like one of the iconic moments of the next season, but like video evidence of it barely exists on the internet uh, as of right now. But the thing that stuck in my brain was right after that play, the Pacers call timeout or there's a TV timeout either way, stoppage and play. And <laughs> they, they get a nice close up shot of precious on the MSG broadcast walking down the floor. And he looks like kind of like mean mugging, like stoic, whatever walking down the floor. And then all of a sudden he catches eyes with Isaiah Hartenstein and Hartenstein does his thing of just screaming. And <laughs> precious just un unfurls this crazy scream that gets caught on camera. And then they chest bump. And that's like what sends you to uh to commercial break. I don't know. I just, 
it lives rent free in my head all the time. Precious is a uh, scream there and the the intensity of that moment. So that's that's my play of the year. I don't know. It's just the one that one that chose to burrow its way into my brain for the rest of the time. All right. I'll, I'll give my my play of the year that, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't that game, but it, it maybe in part inspired uh, my quote of the year from Josh Hart. Um, it was the the double block into the transition jam against the Nets. The Nets were shooting lights out in that game, if I'm remembering correctly, really, really pushing the Knicks down the stretch. Jalen Brunson drives to the rim. His shot gets swatted by Nick Claxton. Nets are breaking to to take the lead. Uh, Knicks legend, uh, locked on Knicks legend, Dennis Smith Jr., Running the fast break, man. How many how many hours did we spend talking about Dennis Smith Jr. on this podcast? We were we were we were down bad, Alex. We couldn't admit it at the time, but we were down about as bad as anyone's ever been down doing a podcast. Um, and that that is a category with a lot of people down bad. Um, Josh Hart tracks him down to block it. Um, OG Ananobi gets his hand on the ball, doesn't quite recover it, and you start screaming, "Oh no!" Because it bounces right to Cam Johnson, who recovers it. OG shows you he's a freak. He jumps, he swats it. Josh Hart tiptoe save to Julius Randle up the court. Um, Randle to Brunson. Randle keeps running. Brunson bounce pass right back to Randle for the jam. Knicks win the game. You knew it was over as soon as that play happened. And I just thought that was an apex in, in a season where like the synergy between Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle is, is so clearly just so far ahead of where it was a year ago. Like that, that play just summed it up perfectly for me. Like the hard hustle, the Ananobi length, um, it 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 had everything. So um, I feel like I'm 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 Stefan on uh, on on SNL. Like like that that play had everything. It was it, it was the best. That that's my number one. All right. Well, let's get into real quick. We can kind of rapid fire these last two awards because yeah, sure. one is I don't know. The last one is silly, so we could just kind of give our best Josh Hart quote of the year. Uh, but most surprising development of this year, I'm just going to present all the candidates because we've talked about so much of this stuff already, and then we can both say our answer. Uh, so our four nominees for most surprising development of the year, uh, Emmanuel Quickly, RJ Barrett, and Quentin Grimes all get traded, and no first-round picks get traded by the Knicks this year. Uh, Dante DiVincenzo turns into one of the NBA's best shooters. Uh, Jalen Brunson makes the leap from a zero time all-star to a top five MVP candidate uh, and all-star and probable first team all NBA. And then the last being that the team was that dominant with OG Ananobi in the lineup, 20 and three in games in which OG Ananobi played Gavin, what is your winner? Um, I'm not going to belabor it because you you already you already laid out the case, but I'm, I'm going Dante DiVincenzo when the Knicks got him. I was like, that's awesome. He's going to be a really good role player for them. I didn't foresee him finishing one three pointer behind Luka Doncic for second most made threes in the NBA. And when you consider that Steph Curry is an alien and belongs in his own category, it's really the most made threes in the NBA. Also finished tied for seventh in percentage out of the top 20 and makes. Just a just a crazy season from him and all all the other. I mean, I, like when you lay it out, it was IQ, RJ, and Grimes all being traded. I, I almost slightly regret that not being my pick, but they, like all those guys individually were were on the table before the year started. Brunson, like I, I don't know, I, I I said it before the year, so it can't be mine. And Ananobi, I, I didn't foresee them being this good. I thought they were going to be really good when they got him. So I'm I'm going Dante. Well, if he makes you feel better, I'm going to flip flop, and I was mm. initially going to say. The, the Knicks being 20 and three with Ananobi. But the, as I just said it out loud, uh, the IQ, RJ and Grimes getting traded and no first rounders getting traded uh, stands out to me. I think that we for sure thought that some of the first rounders were going to get traded if the Knicks made some form of deal. And yet they managed to get out of two trades that significantly helped the team without trading a single first round pick. Uh, it was a little surprising though to see all, see, all three of those players go when there was so much contention over holding them out of talks for like Donovan Mitchell, for example. Um, and, you know, all the drama that we went through for a, a couple years, you know, waiting to see what was going to end up happening. We figured that those guys would probably all three of them be the highlight of some big star package. Um, and yet, I mean, OG, I, we just agreed and just defined is a star. So, uh, you know, IQ and RJ were traded for a star, just albeit a different type of star than what we were thinking of initially. Um, and I'm glad that they're doing well. Grimes was traded for Bogdanovich, which essentially they just subbed him in for a first round pick, um, if not multiple first round picks. So it all's well that ends well, but it, it was still very surprising given where we started 
with that. Um, and Gavin, I, I don't even feel the need to to cast a vote here. I'm gonna let you just present your favorite Josh Hart quotes of the year because I think they're all pretty damn good. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna save my winner for last. Um, and I'll, I'll just run through these. Uh, Josh Hart on Brunson's 40 point games. That's a league company. Maybe he'll pass a little bit more next game. Um, I love like all, all the hard and Brunson just, just crapping on each other. Like, like it, it, it never gets old for me. It gets me every single time. Uh, Josh Hart on the, we want Taj chance uh, word. I can't say uh, I wanted Taj to what I play 42 minutes. I was about to start begging for him. <laughs> uh, the first word makes it better. So Google it on your own time. Uh, Monty Williams comments. Um, that was where Monty Williams was like, like, I don't want to be part of the story, but, you know, the ref screwed up this game. He said, if you didn't, and Josh Hart responds, if you didn't want to be part of the story, you should have told his guys to defend better. Say it with your chest, Josh Hart. Josh Hart, if he agrees with Doc Rivers, that he is the heart of the Knicks. I don't know. He's the doctor. Josh Hart, what the Knicks can do to slow down Nikola Jokic. Pray. Um, and my winner, uh, Josh Hart on Mikhail Bridges um, after the Knicks blew them out yet again. It's like that SpongeBob mean meme when squidward is looking out the window to see spongebob and patrick having fun mikhail is squidward i i think that quote is not only hilarious and savage i think it's going to single-handedly get mikhail bridges either on the knicks or on a different team this offseason so it's incredible espionage and sabotage from josh hart uh one one honorable mention uh, uh just that came out today after someone made an edit of, of tom thibodeau you know that I forgot who the rapper is, but like like famous video of a rapper coming out. Tom Thibodeau's in the video. It's the greatest uh, concert opening of the last couple of years. Um, he's seen the video. Mitchell Robinson showed it to him. And Tom Thibodeau apparently thinks that Mitchell Robinson made the video. I've heard the term terminally online. I have not heard of terminally not online. Tom Thibodeau is terminally not online, Alex. That it, it is wild. I don't think he's ever used the internet. I'm not sure if he's ever Googled anything before. Um, but the, the fact that he, I, I think, legitimately believes that Mitchell Robinson made this edit is uh, is is exceptional. So that's uh, that's not really a quote. It's more of a happening. But I, I I thought it belonged in this category. Anyways, Josh Hart is a gem. I hope the Knicks never trade him. Yeah, little little did Tibbs know that AI did that. And once he learns about AI, forget about it. He's gonna be using it to summarize all of his all of his notes and everything else. He's gonna be like, deliver me my game plan in a in a concise paragraph. And then he's gonna crumple it up and throw it away and go back to his 20 page uh version instead. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Hope you all agree with these awards. But if you don't and you're on like YouTube and you want to like comment what your favorite moments were or whatever, please let us know. And let us know how silly we were for forgetting your favorite. Um, but until next time, which will be, I think, talking about who the Knicks are actually going to be playing in the playoffs, uh, which will be pretty exciting. But until next time, thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Peace out, everybody.